we're going to be talking about greatness. And we use that word a lot in our day and time. Uh, there was a, a man who owned a logging company, and as he sat in the office one day, he was a big man, about six foot eight, 300 pounds, solid as a rock. And uh, he put out a help wanted sign, and uh, as he was squeezed into an office chair, he heard the, the bell on the door ring, and he looked and saw a little head bobbing over the counter. Thought it was some child that came to sell cookies and stood up to see a man standing there, and this man wasn't quite five foot tall and maybe weighed 90 pounds, so in his pockets. And, um, and so uh, he said, what can I do for you, sir? And he said, I'm here to apply for the job. I want to be a, uh, a lumberjack. And uh, he said, well, okay, well, uh, um, what are your qualifications? He said, well, I hate to brag, but I want you to know I'm the, I'm the greatest lumberjack in the world. And the big man just sort of laughed, and he said, sir, I have worked with some of the greatest lumberjacks. I work with men that make Paul Bunyan look like a French maid. And so uh, we're, I, I, I fell trees from the great... Uh, Rockies to the Appalachians from uh, the great northwest to California down to the rainforest in the Amazon. Uh, where have you worked before, sir? He said, well, have you ever heard of the uh, Sahara Forest? And the big man laughed. He said, you mean the Sahara Desert? He said, huh, it is now. <laughs> the greatest. We use that word great all the time. When I pastored at Columbia, uh, we lived in the parsonage on the other side of the church was a huge church cemetery and they had paved a little road around that cemetery and it was exactly a half a mile so people came and walked on that uh, walking road uh, because of the safety and all that and uh, on the I walked morning and night and I passed a tombstone a little larger than some of the others and it had a man's name and had the dates of his birth and his death and then it uh, it had just uh, the epitaph was uh, he was a great man. And I passed that almost every morning, every night, and, and uh, I thought about what, what made him a great man. And, and so I was standing back there with a, a friend and church member, and, and uh, we were close to that tombstone, and he said, uh, have you ever noticed that? And I, I looked and I said, I have. I've pondered about that quite a bit. And, and we stood there, leaned up on shovels, and he... Uh, he looked at it and he said, well, I knew him. He said, you know, he, wasn't, he never married, had no children, uh, didn't have any siblings. And he picked out that headstone himself. And he had that epitaph put on there. And then there was just sort of an awkward silence. And he looked at me and he said, I knew him. And he wasn't. He wasn't the greatest man. I wonder sometimes how when we cross over from this life and that we look back upon our life, do we really want to be known as great? Or do we want to learn the lesson Jesus is going to teach us today? None of us are good on our own. We may be good as we line up to one another and think of ourselves compared to one another. But the Bible says that there are none that are good, none of us. The only goodness that comes into our life is by way of the grace of God through His Son. And the gospel is true that we're all sinners deserving and on our way to hell. And God has intervened through his son Jesus and made a way possible. And he changes us. And that's where our goodness derives from. But I hope that at the end of my life, whether I'm known as a great man, I doubt that. But I believe that the lesson Jesus teaches is that personal goodness is far more valuable than personal greatness. Now, how did Jesus illustrate this? How did he teach this lesson? I want to start out by illustrating this lesson the same way that Jesus did. And so I'm going to call Elliot. Hey, Elliot. Hey, buddy. Come see Papa. Hey. You had a good morning? You've been good? Look at Papa. Listen, did you play with your friends this morning? You know what? I love you. Yeah, give me that. Okay. You go back and play with your friends, and I'll see you at lunch, okay? Okay, bye. I don't think any of Jesus' disciples, whenever he said, okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson about greatness, really expected that. 
didn't expect for Jesus to pull up a little child into his lap. We, we talk about great all the time. If you Google great, uh, Google will give you five million, over 5,700,000 great. We call everything And then there's greater and greatest. There was a uh, kind of three restaurants in the whole town that were all so one man restaurant in the city. And so the second guy the next day put up a bigger sign that said, this is the greatest restaurant in the city. And the third guy hand wrote on a little uh, piece of paper and taped it on his window and said, this is the greatest restaurant in this block. Uh, this morning we're going to see how Jesus is great really he is. Look there, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in verse 30. I'm going to read them, but some of these verses we're going to deal with in a couple of weeks uh, in conjunction with... Uh, uh, the theme, but there in uh, Mark 9 and verse 30, it says, From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Let me pause there. I'm not going to specifically deal with these verses this morning, but Jesus has already stated to them earlier in chapter 9, chapter 8, uh, that, that this was the necessity of the gospel. He's stating it here, and then we'll deal with it in chapter 10. But they didn't fully understand in their theology this was not what they thought the Messiah was going to come to do. And so we pick up again in verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Jesus teaches them a lesson about greatness and about goodness. In 2001, Jim Collins wrote a book. The name of the book was Good to Great, Why Some Companies Take the Leap and, and Others Don't. What he did is he looked at several successful companies and then he developed some management principles, and, and they are good principles of how some companies just go from being good to that level of greatness. And so, and, and some of his principles, the reason I read it is that there's some good principles there about management, and some of those that you apply even in church as far as management in, in that sense. But, but as you look at that, and you think about how the world looks at going from good to great, it is completely upside down from what Jesus is teaching us and what the Bible teaches about if we are not, not from a corporate idea but from a servant's idea. Moving from that sense of greatness is completely different than the world shows us for greatness. So I want us to explore these truths and kind of unpack these from this text today and for us to understand what God says to be great in the kingdom really means for us. And for you to come to that point to achieve greatness in the kingdom work. It's upside down from this world because the number one thing you have to do is that you have to resist selfish ambitions. And everything in this world and in the corporate world tells you that if you're going to go from good and you really apply yourself, you'll move to greatness. Everything in the kingdom work tells us that we're moved to be servants. It's sort of upside down from what the world explores for us. Now you stop and you think about these disciples and what the setting for this text. Peter, James, and John have been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They have seen with their eyes the very Shekinah glory of Jesus. They've been in the presence of glory. And they see all the turmoil, but Jesus walks in and he, he heals a little boy by by casting out a demon and healing this little boy based upon the doubting faith of his father. And they have watched this great miracle, and as they're walking away from the essence of the gospel, and they're trying to process that, but 
instead of thinking through what Jesus has just done and who Jesus is and what they just witnessed and the truth that they should be dwelling on to try to understand, instead they walk along and talk about which one of them is the greatest. Who's the best? Who's the closest? And we use that word great all the time. Let me just kind of go through quickly and talk about a little how we think of great. We think of great because we talk about the Great Lakes and then we talk about Great Britain and we talk about the Great Plains and the Great Wall of China and the Great White Shark that swims in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, history has dubbed several uh, known as the Great. There's Alexander the Great and there is Herod the Great and there is Catherine the Great. We go from great from A to Z, or at least to X. You got, you got uh, Albert the Great all the way to Xerxes the Great. I mean, we talk about great in terms of humans. Um, Wikipedia says that there's 114 people throughout history that have been labeled the great. And that's what the disciples are trying to figure out. Who's the great? I'm Peter the Great. No, I'm John the Great. No, I'm James the Great. And that is the essence of sin. Whenever we start thinking about from our own selfish perspective that the world ought to re rotate around us. We don't know sometimes a whole lot about theology, but we know a whole lot about meology. How I am the center of the universe and everything about life is supposed to revolve around me. If you, uh, we, we were standing two weeks ago today, Steve and I were standing, uh, leaned up on a, uh, in a doorway in Antigua, uh, Guatemala, and they were, if you're ever in a third world country in one of the bigger towns, cities, uh, there's vendors that come by. Everybody wants to say you something. And uh, there were these guys walking around. I couldn't figure out what they were trying to sell. It, was, it wasn't a fishing pole. That's what I thought at first. And I couldn't figure. It was, a, it was a long stick, and it had a little apparatus on one end and one on the other end. It was a selfie stick where you can put your camera in there, put your phone in there, and hold it out and take a picture of yourself. CBS News says that Americans, since the invention of the selfie sticks, that we take 93 million pictures of ourselves in selfies every single day. That, that's who we are. That's who these disciples were, as they walked around saying, who's the greatest one? That is not the question for us to be asking, and if you are... If that's what your goal in life is, is to be the best, is to be the greatest for the world to revolve around you, there's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with, with doing the very best that you can and being the best you that you can be. But whenever it comes to the point that you are consumed, that everything is about me, then you have lost sight of what it means to be a child of God and to be called into His work. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Jim Collins, even in, even in the corporate world, in that book, Good to Great, he notices, he makes this observation. He said, the best CEOs in our research display tremendous ambition for their company, yet at the same time they display a remarkable humility about themselves, ascribing much of their own success to luck, discipline, our preparation rather than personal genius. We know it's not luck or preparation. We know that it is the very power of God that allows us to be blessed with what we have, that God blesses us in what we do, and what we do, the good that we are involved in, that we can come back, and it's just simply an offering to offer to Him. He's called us. And if you're going to be a child of God, if you're going to be good, have that personal goodness about your life. It is consumed in bringing glory to God, so you got to resist that selfish ambition, that pride. One man that I have admired through the years is Dr. Jim Henry. He was a longtime pastor at First Baptist Church in Orlando, one of the largest churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he was there almost 30 years. And he told a story of how he was invited back to his alma mater uh, Georgetown College in Georgetown, Kentucky. And he was going to receive the Outstanding Alumnus Award and, and, uh, and uh, he was going to be the keynote speaker that year's graduation. And so he walked around campus and, you know, uh, renewed some of those memories. And that day as he set out at a, at a spring graduation and, 
and uh, he sat there in his crisp black robe, and he looked out, and he thought about his years there, and as he heard the introduction that they gave of him, he was starting to feel pretty good about himself, and he thought, when I was a student here, nobody thought that I'd be successful, but man, I, I've done pretty well for myself, and he could just, he said he could just feel his head starting to swell, and about that time, a bird flew over and blew him, he said, from his cap all the way down to his shoulder. And Dr. Henry said, and that bird had a healthy diet. And everybody, there was just a hush that fell over the crowd. And so Dr. Henry stepped up to the podium and he said, God sure does have a good sense of humor. Just about the time a fellow's starting to feel too good about himself, but God reminds us just how little we are. Folks, if we're going to be great in the kingdom of God, it has nothing to do with what I can do for God. So avoid that selfish ambition. The second thing Jesus reminds us in the kingdom work, that service is better than status. Look in verse 35 again. Sitting down, he called them and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last and the servant of all. In our world, everybody wants to be on top. Top of the ladder, top of the heap, top of the list. Jesus says that in the kingdom work, that it is completely opposite. That in the kingdom work, the greater one is the one who serves. James 4, 6 says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James chapter 4, and verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Jesus demonstrated a, a servant's heart, and that's what he asked of us. I'm afraid that too often my life has been consumed in the same thing it was as a little boy. I used to go to First Baptist Church Amory as a little boy, and on Wednesday afternoon right after school is when we had RAs. And so we would rush from school and get to the church uh, because uh, they had gone down to Mr. Tony's that morning and they had uh, a dozen donuts there waiting on us whenever we got out of school. So my motive wasn't just exactly to be at RA. So we'd go and we'd gobble up donuts and lick our thumbs to get up all the glaze even out of it. And then after the donuts were consumed, then we'd stand and we'd give the royal pledge. I pledge as royal ambassador to do my best, and we'd, we'd recite the pledge. We'd talk a little bit about missionaries, and then we'd go out and we'd play ball whatever the season was, football or baseball or basketball. And, uh, and then after that, they would carry us in, and we would all stand at the Coke machine in the fellowship hall at First Baptist in line to get a free Coke. Now, I will say that there are many times that I went, I don't remember a thing about RAs, but I remember those, uh, those basketball games. I remember the donuts and the free Cokes. Kind of like Vance Havner said, if you give them a Pepsi Cola and a rubber alligator, that's all you give them. When they go home, they're going to drink the Pepsi, lose the alligator, and they won't have anything. But if you give them a Pepsi Cola and a rubber alligator and give them Jesus, even after the Pepsi's gone and the rubber alligator's lost, then they'll have something to last for eternity. I am thankful for Mr. Herschel Lockhart, who gave us more than Cokes and donuts. He gave us Jesus, too. And so... But in that line, waiting for that Coke, there was a lot of shoving. Who was going to be at the front of the line? We would race to get there. I wasn't the fastest one, but I was one of the fastest ones. And if I wasn't the fastest one there, then I could nudge them out. I mean, we would push and shove. I remember more than one fight because we were trying to be first in the line to get that free Coke. That is the way that much of life is about. And there is nothing more opposite in the kingdom, instead of saying me first, kingdom work steps back and says you first. We're here to serve. And when we lose sight of that, then we lose sight of being good in the kingdom work. The last truth that is unfolded may be the most important. What is the pattern? What is the pattern Jesus gives for humility? It is a child. And I'm afraid that some of us have just grown up too much. We need to remember what it means to be a child. I'm not talking about acting childish. Some of us know that well too well. 
but we need to remember what it's like to be childlike. So just let your, so just let your spirit sort of move back at what it meant to be a child. If you look at the parallel passage, whenever Jesus said, okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson about being great, you can almost see Peter. He said, okay, I'm going to show you what greatness is. And Peter reached up, <clears throat> straightened his tie, and he's getting ready to stand up. Object lesson. He's going to say, now, the object is, so Peter's ready. And Thomas looks over at him. Thomas says, I doubt that. And then Jesus pulls a child up into his lap. Listen to the parallel passage over in Matthew 18. And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So let's rediscover how to think like a child. The first kingdom kid. It's a revolutionary statement when you say that God only has children in his kingdom. And if you are a kingdom kid, one of heaven's children, then you have to learn and relearn an unrestrained joy. You just watch children. Miss Thea Kay had jam up here the other day, Friday I think it was. I came walking through and I was just sort of making the motion and I looked up and it is so easy for a child to smile. You get them a million younger. And you remember my grandmother used to call that you get your giggle box turned upside down. You remember how funny things were and where were they the funniest? In church. I remember sitting on the back row, I was about four years old, and bless her heart, this lady was probably senile, I, but she was 150, and, and uh, you know, when you're four or five, and we were at my grandmother's church, and we were going to decoration, so we sat on the back row, and they were having the Lord's Supper, and they went out. So uh, the, the pastor said, oh, the disciples all sipped from one another one cup, and they passed the cup around, uh, so if you're running out and there's not enough, y'all sit from another cup. And that old lady turned to the other woman and she cussed in church. Now that's wrong. But to a four-year-old, that's the funniest thing that can be said. They had to take me out because my giggle box got turned upside down. Oh, my goodness. It, I, my goodness. This is, this is, as a four-year-old, I thought, this is great. I didn't understand, but... I do understand for a child that they come to that point that they enjoy life. How easy to say to a child, I love you, and how easy it is for a child to say, I love you. You need to be able to have that unrestrained joy. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. Why is it that we can't have that kind of joy as a Proverbs says, a joyful heart doeth good like a good medicine. Some of y'all need a good dose today. You need to remember how to enjoy life. You need to remember why are we so afraid to laugh. The second thing a kingdom kid is able to do is to be able to have unreserved love. It is just so natural. And I am so ashamed that we have allowed the world to rob us of that unrestrained love. There's appropriate ways to share our brotherly affection for one another. Some of us aren't huggers, but hey, the longer I live, the further down the road I get, the more I'm getting used to it. It's okay to express, but everybody's so worried about, about uh, inappropriate behavior, and certainly we don't want to get involved into the, any of that, but, but we let the, rob, the world rob us. I, I was, when we were in care to group to talk, Land. And we went one day, we preached at a women's prison, preached at a men's prison. The pastor went with us at the men's prison. And uh, afterwards, through Tuan, our translator, he was just so pleased. And he was so kind. He's just shared with me through her uh, how he appreciated that I preached the gospel and just made the gospel paramount and that I shared the gospel and how you can be saved. He was, he was just so pleased with that. And so as we started walking away, he reached out and he grabbed my hand. Now, you know, we don't normally do that, but I thought he was just going to lead me through, and as we walked along, he didn't let go. And here we're walking, and then all of a sudden, he starts swinging. <laughs> of course, I'm doing this because he's a lot shorter than me. 
And so here we're walking, and it goes through my mind, here I am walking through a men's prison yard, holding a man's hand, swinging, and then it convicted my heart to say, you know what? At least the Lord didn't say, greet one another with a brotherly kiss. So I held his hand, and I was grateful. That, that was just an expression of affection. And whenever I got my heart right, then I received in that way. We ought to be able to be kingdom kids and have unrestrained love how we are able to appropriately express that love, but really what matters is what's on the heart. The last thing is for kingdom kids to have uncomplicated trust. How many parents have set their little child up on the countertop, stepped back and said jump? Do they ever hesitate? I mean, they don't worry about falling. They don't worry about your catching. They know that they're safe and they trust you. That's how I ought to live my life that I have an uncomplicated... I can remember as a kid, I'd hear Bible stories, and they were amazing to me. You know why? Because I believed them. They were true. There were no theories that were having to be worked out. There were no conflicts that I was trying to resolve. We are guilty sometimes of making God's truth too complicated. It's not a code that we have to crack. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard the story how in the CIA, in the deepest... Uh, parts of Langley uh, that one of the men found a slip of paper in an elevator and it had a code on it. It was K1P2COA-K5. And so he went into a meeting with some of the top minds and he said, men, I found this code. I think somebody dropped it and this may be something that's really bad. We need to figure this out. And so they spent a long time trying to figure out what that, K, that code was. k one P2COA-K5. And finally, one of the ladies came in, and she is passed to her, and she said, guys, this is a knitting code. It means knit one, purl two, cast on eight, knit five. And sometimes that's what we do to the Bible. And we take the Bible, and we try to make some code out of it. And we make it so difficult when God is just simply making it true that we're to trust Him. You can boil down and summarize the Christian life in three statements. That Jesus says, come to me, follow me, abide in me. If we live up to that, there's no code to that. That's what Jesus calls us to. And we as God's kids have that kind of joy and that kind of love and that kind of trust. Now there are some takeaway truths. If you don't remember all others, I want you to remember these two things. And I want to illustrate them today. The first one is, in our world, we recognize celebrities and superstars and VIPs in heaven. They don't. There are no little people. There are no little people. 1990s, Leona Hemsley, who was a billionaire, she owned a lot of upscale hotel properties, and she was arrested and convicted for tax evasion. She was interviewed and asked about taxes, and she, her infamous statement was, uh, oh, well, we don't pay taxes. The little people pay taxes. Um, I wonder if she contemplated that when she was in prison. But uh, there are no little people. Whenever God looks upon those who are in our life, there are no little people. And God looks at us, and there's nobody here that is unimportant to God. And there's nobody here no matter what your emotions may tell you, no matter what the circumstances of life may tell you, there's nobody here who is a loser. There's nobody here that is unimportant. I've asked Miss Ginger to remind us, and this song just tells us what it means in heaven's eyes for us to know that in heaven's eyes that uh, there are no little people. prayer rose up to heaven a fragile soul was losing ground sorting through the earthly babble heaven heard the sound was a life of no distinction, no so 
successes only tries yet gazing down on this unlovely one there was love in heaven's eyes in heaven's eyes there are no losers in heaven heaven's eyes there are no little people but along with that as well that in heaven's eyes there are no little tasks he, if God has called you he's called you to be faithful I want to read a passage that is terrifying well the first passage from the book of Matthew 10 42 tells you that no matter what you do no matter how insignificant the world says it is important Jesus said, and whoever in the name even of a disciple gives to you or to these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And then the terrifying thought, Matthew 25 and verse 44, says, then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? and did not take care of you. And then he will answer them, Truly I said to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. There are no little tasks when done in the name of Jesus. There are no little tasks when Jesus sets us to it. At the end of your life, how do you want to be remembered? Because I'm here to tell you, I know, except maybe for my wife and children, they'll remember me for a few days. But after I'm gone, the world will forget me ten minutes after I'm gone. 
Do, would you rather the world remember you for those few ten minutes that you were a great man or a great woman? Or instead, would you want to step into heaven and hear the words, Well done, my good and faithful servant.